Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is June 28, 1979, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 47. The final Friday in May last month was a sunny spring day in Chicago. It was a perfect day to fly, and O'Hare Airport was busy as usual. Inside the terminal complex thousands of air travelers were rushing to and from their flights. Nearby the runways were alive. Airplanes were taking off and landing in a steady stream, one right after another. It was just another day at the world's busiest airport. Shortly before 3 o'clock that Friday afternoon, 258 passengers boarded American Airlines Flight 191. It was a DC-10 jumbo jet bound for Los Angeles. With its crew of 13, there were 271 people aboard when the doors were closed. Then the DC-10 was rolled away from the terminal and taxied out toward the runway. There Flight 191 took its place at the end of a line of jets waiting to take off. Meanwhile a passenger waiting in the terminal for a different flight was passing the time by taking snapshots. Reportedly the man with the camera was a pilot himself. Most flyers simply enjoy watching airplanes, and apparently he was no exception. Just after 3 p.m. the O'Hare Tower cleared Flight 191 for takeoff. The big DC-10 moved onto the end of the runway. Three mammoth engines, one on the tail and one under each wing, changed their tune from a whine to a roar. The engines strained like locomotives in their mounts, and the jumbo jet began moving down the runway. Half a minute or so later, after rolling a mile and a half, the nose of the DC-10 rotated upward for takeoff. Up to that moment everything had been normal and routine, but then, without warning, the world began to end for Flight 191. The engine under the left wing suddenly ripped loose. It lurched forward, then up and over the top of the wing. It smashed down onto the runway, but the suddenly crippled DC-10 continued to climb. The plane reached an altitude of about 600 feet but by then it had rolled steeply to the left. The wings were vertical instead of level, and a DC-10 began to fall. Moments later the plane disappeared in a giant fireball as it hit the ground. In the terminal the man with the camera caught a picture of the airliner on its side in the air. Moments later he was photographing the fireball, which was partially obscured by airport buildings. Later the man who took those famous pictures Michael Laughlin of Ontario, Canada, gave his reactions to UPI. He reportedly said, quote, After I had taken all the pictures, I just stood there stunned, wondering to myself, did this really happen? Did I really take these pictures? Did that plane really crash? I thought there has to be some other explanation for this crazy airplane turning over and for all that fire. I just couldn't believe it. I just stood there shaking." Unquote. My friends, reality is always hard to accept whenever it is unpleasant. Our minds play tricks and tell us it just cannot be. Like the man who photographed the crash in DC-10, we don't want to believe our own eyes and ears. Instead of accepting the truth as it is when it disturbs us, we try to deny its existence. Right now this is happening to some listeners to the Dr. Beter AUDIO LETTER. Last month I made public one of the most carefully guarded of all intelligence secrets, that is, the existence of organic robotoids. As I explained last month, they are now the key fact of life in understanding current world events. Without knowing this very important secret, you will have no hope of understanding present and coming events. Even so, some of my listeners are not waiting for events to speak for themselves. Instead they are shakily telling themselves there just has to be some other explanation for the strange things in today's news. These people, my friends, are turning away from the AUDIO LETTER. They want only to have their ears tickled with the words they like to hear. They want only to hear the words they have heard before over and over again year in and year out. Runaway government, taxes, dishonest politicians, the Russian threat, and so on. With these things they can feel dissatisfied yet content 
reassured that nothing really ever changes. But as I said last month, I knew very well that this would happen before I ever said a word about the Robotoids. I knew that there would be a falling away by some who have followed the AUDIO LETTER up to now, but there is only one way that the AUDIO LETTER can serve those who do choose to listen. That way is to continue to reveal the truth exactly as it is. If I were to withhold crucial information whenever it is frightening or unfamiliar, perhaps I could avoid losing any listeners, but then the AUDIO LETTER would end up serving no one. No one, that is, but the enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ. When our Lord walked the earth 2,000 years ago, He said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He gave the good news that a new day was dawning for those ready to accept it. He began awakening His followers from their slumber, and those who were benefiting from the oppressive status quo of that day began to feel threatened. Soon Jesus made it clear that He was not talking about politics or military conquest, but something deeper than that. Many of His followers fell away in disappointment, but the ruling circles felt even more threatened. Their real control over the people was through their beliefs, and Jesus was opening their eyes with the truth. So they had Him crucified, and the people cheered. My friends, the French have a saying that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Our modern world is radically different in some ways from the Mediterranean world of 2,000 years ago, yet today as then there are those who want to keep you ignorant and asleep so that they can control and use you. The Dr. Peter Audio letter is interfering with these plans simply by revealing the truth from behind the scenes. And because the influence of the AUDIO LETTER is growing faster and faster, a hate campaign is now underway in an effort to destroy it. Right now some people are turning away, but others are awakening from their slumber. Like Rip Van Winkle, they are beginning to open their eyes after living for years in a dream world of the past. They are beginning to ask questions and to see for themselves what is really taking place in our world. After years of sitting glued to the television sets, more and more Americans are beginning to talk to one another again. People are gathering in groups to listen to the AUDIO LETTER and then arguing about it. Concerned listeners are making countless copies of my AUDIO LETTERS to give to friends and relatives. In New York City and elsewhere, Unauthorized copies are being sold by illegal scalping operations for $10 and more, and these homemade and scalped copies of my AUDIO LETTERS are themselves being listened to in groups and further recopied. The majority of those who are benefiting from the AUDIO LETTER nowadays are doing so without contributing to its support. Free and scalped copies, after all, do nothing to help sustain the AUDIO LETTER, which is expensive and difficult to produce. Nevertheless. The Dr. Beter AUDIO LETTER is having an impact that is growing wider every day. Now that the four Rockefeller Brothers have all left the scene, as I have revealed in recent months, even the major media are beginning to take notice of the AUDIO LETTER. This past Easter Sunday morning, April 15, 1979, it was a syndicated feature article in the Sunday Magazine of the Washington Post. A month later, on May 17, it was an article on page B2 of the New York Times, and earlier this month, on June 11, I was contacted by a producer for the CBS television program 60 Minutes about the Guyana story. Because of the growing impact of the AUDIO LETTER, those who benefit by keeping you asleep and ignorant feel increasingly threatened by it, and so a hate campaign has now erupted in an effort to destroy the AUDIO LETTER. All kinds of techniques are being used in this hate campaign. Articles are being printed in certain publications that stoop to outright libel in an effort to defame my personal reputation. Damaging rumors of all kinds are being circulated. Whisper campaigns are being stirred up with ridiculous stories about my family. Now I'm told they are even picking on my little five-year-old daughter Petra saying somehow 
that Petra has a Russian name. Petra, my friends, is simply the female form of the Greek word meaning rock. It is also the name of an ancient, beautiful, and historical crossroads town in Jordan. The hate campaigners are all waving the flag in an effort to dispute the patriotism of the AUDIO LETTER, but their arguments are based on deceit and fraud, not truth. Christ ones do not do such things. What is most significant is the timing of this hate campaign. All of the groups now attacking the Dr. Beter AUDIO LETTER have one identifying characteristic in common. In every case they have spent years in pointing accusing fingers at the Rothschilds. This has led many people with some knowledge of past history to accept the leadership of these organizations, and yet years of finger-pointing by these groups has had no effect at all on the Rothschilds. The only people really affected are the duped ones, the followers of these groups and publications. Until very recently the Rothschilds have actually been in a state of eclipse by the Rockefellers, but since the Bolshevik coup d'etat secretly terminated Rockefeller power early this year, the situation has changed. In the past two or three months I have focused attention on the Rothschilds and their bid for renewed power and as if on signal, the Dr. Beter AUDIO LETTER is now under attack, supposedly by anti Rothschild groups. False opposition, my friends, is a trick even older than Machiavelli. The hate campaign now underway will do its damage, but it will not stop the AUDIO LETTER. My employer is our Lord Jesus Christ and my AUDIO LETTER SERIES WILL NOT END UNTIL IT IS TIME TO END. This month I am beginning the fifth year of my AUDIO LETTER. It has been another year of surprises and dramatic events. It was only one year ago next month that the oldest of the four Rockefeller brothers, John D. III, died abruptly in an alleged auto accident and it was only five months ago that the all-out Bolshevik coup d'etat against the Rockefellers began with the murder of Nelson Rockefeller. Today the Bolsheviks themselves are in retreat thanks to the Russian organic robotoids, so the years to come will hold even more surprises for us all. My topics this month are Topic No. 1, The Scientific Background of the Russian Robotoids. Topic No. 2, The Russian Strategy to Dismantle Bolshevik Power, and Topic No. 3, The Shifting Currents Between War and Peace. Topic No. 1. In the spring of 1973 my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, was published by George Braziller, New York, New York. In the book I revealed in detail how forces were being set in motion deliberately to destroy the United States dollar. I named a lot of names, and I explained the role being played by various individuals and multinational corporations. Of all the individuals I named in the book, the most important was that of the late David Rockefeller. He was the kingpin in the plan to destroy our dollar and our economy, as I showed in the book. But when he was asked for his public comment about my book, he said, quote, interesting science fiction." Unquote. But as events have proven, my book was anything but science fiction. I was a lone voice in 1973 because I was revealing things that were not publicly known. Instead, until I went public with them, these things had been known only to a handful of the most powerful in America and abroad. For that reason, many people found what I revealed then hard to believe, yet today the things I warned about have already come true or are happening now behind the scenes. When I wrote my book in 1973, Americans had yet to experience an embargo of foreign oil. The dollar was still thought of as almighty, and my warnings that it would soon shrivel sounded preposterous to many Americans. But today who in his right mind would speak of the so-called almighty dollar? As for gold, Americans could not even own it legally in 1973 except under special circumstances. Very few Americans even thought about gold in 1973. So the plans I exposed in my book for gold prices to shoot up past $200 an ounce sounded ridiculous to many, but today 
Who among us is unaware of the daily news reports about astronomical gold prices? In 1973 I spoke of stagnation with inflation, of shortages, of financial distress in municipal governments, and on and on. At that time these things sounded too far out to many of my readers. It sounded like science fiction. But today? Just look around you, my friends. Look at the gas lines, the trucker's strike, the defaults and near defaults by major cities, the prices that change almost daily in your grocery stores. Today everyone talks about these things. They are just facts of life. But when I warned about them six years ago I was ridiculed for saying they would happen because I was out of step with the crowd. The same thing is happening now in the wake of my revelations last month about the Russian organic robotoids. The conventional wisdom, of course, is that there just cannot be such things, or at least if they are possible they must lie far in the future, not now. But my friends, the conventional wisdom is wrong, dead wrong. They are not only possible but they are real, and they are walking among us right now. To those who are ignorant of the scientific advances that have taken place in the past 20 to 30 years, they sound incredible. But within a small select group of scientists, both in and out of government, here and abroad, the existence of robotoids is known. And certain of those who know and understand about them are faithful listeners to the Dr. Beter AUDIO LETTER. As I mentioned in my introductory comments, those who seek to control us want to keep us all in a horse and buggy mentality. That way we remain unaware of the forces we are confronting and therefore more vulnerable. Ever since World War II began four decades ago, we Americans have been living with a shroud of secrecy in the military and scientific fields. As a result, most Americans today are actually living in the past without knowing it. But in my AUDIO LETTERS I'm trying to bring you up to date with reality. For the past four years I've been letting you in on developments which have taken decades to materialize in secret. Learning about all these things over such a short time span is like having the world itself change almost overnight. So it is little wonder that some of my listeners are getting a case of future shock from my AUDIO LETTERS. By the way, the term Future Shock is taken from the famous book titled Future Shock by Alvin Toffler. The book was published nearly ten years ago in 1970 by Random House. Toffler defines Future Shock as, quote, the shattering stress and disorientation that we induce in individuals by subjecting them to too much change in too short a time, unquote. In his book Toffler called attention to the fact that numerous rapid and drastic new developments are taking place today without people quite knowing how to cope with it all. Among these developments Toffler discussed the revolutionary advances in biology and genetics. Quoting leading scientists in the field, he gave examples of astonishing things which are either possible now or will be soon. All of these are fascinating to read about, and many are frightening as well. In particular, several items point directly toward organic robotoids, although the book does not say so. As I explained last month, an organic robotoid is an artificial robot-like creature. It is a kind of biological machine with a biological computer brain. With this in mind, consider the words of Arne Tassilius, a biochemist and Nobel Prize winner. As quoted in Future Shock nearly a decade ago, he said, It is quite obvious that computers so far are just bad imitations of our brains. Once we learn more about how the brain acts, I would be surprised if we could not construct a sort of biological computer. Such a computer might have electronic components modeled after biological components in the real brain, and at some distant point in the future it is conceivable that biological elements themselves might be parts of the machine." Unquote. Dr. Tassilius was on the right track with these words of ten years ago, but he was too conservative. 
At that time the Russians were already on the threshold of their key breakthrough which I referred to last month. That breakthrough had to do with the biological computer brain, which is the key to a successful robotoid. In a few moments I'll tell you more about that. In other places, too, one can find many bits and pieces of information that point straight toward robotoids, but you will not often find this information on television or in the newspapers. Instead it crops up here and there in specialized publications directed at particular audiences. An example of this is the book The Dynamics of Change, published in 1967 by Prentice Hall, Inglewood Cliffs, New Jersey. The book is copyrighted by Kaiser Aluminum and Chemical Corporation, having first published all the material in six issues of Kaiser Aluminum News. The revolution in biology and genetics is only a very small part of the subject matter in the book. Even so, listen to just a few brief quotes. Under the heading Genetic Manipulation, quote, the ability to control the formation of new beings may be one of the most basic developments of the future. Recent discoveries about the nucleonic acids, the basic building blocks of life, have led to the belief that man may someday be able to treat genes in such a way that desired characteristics can be realized." Unquote. Under the heading Direct Education of Brain Cells, quote, Experiments indicate that certain chemicals in the brain will, when implanted in another brain, transfer knowledge." Unquote. Under the heading Man-Machine Some Biases, quote, Computers exist which can learn, remember, see, seek goals, reason, walk, sing on key, talk, be irritable, play games, grasp, adapt to an environment and even design improvements in themselves." Unquote. My friends, remember these things were published for public consumption and a dozen years ago. Further under the same heading, quote, Man-like computers may one day contain plasma circulating through a viscera-like envelope, allowing them to be self-healing. Finally, under the heading Human Robots, quote, an electronic circuit that imitates two neurons. The cells of the human brain has been built and has enabled a robot to deal with some unexpected situations, but the neuron structure was bulky. The brain has billions of neurons, meaning an incredible miniaturization job will be necessary before truly human robots are developed." Unquote. Since those words were written, of course, incredible things have been done in miniaturizing electronic computers. For example, a mere dozen years ago there was no such thing as an electronic hand calculator. Within a few years they were on the market, but at a cost of hundreds of dollars. Today, just a few scant years further on, they are all over the place, tiny, inexpensive, and able to do things only bulky computers could do a decade ago. But these things only hint very vaguely at the scientific strides that have made organic robotoids a reality. The man-made biological machine, known as a robotoid, is remarkable from head to foot, but the most astonishing thing about them is their ability to simulate human beings, not just in appearance but in behavior. In other words, the most crucial and most amazing thing about a Russian organic robotoid is its biological computer brain. The developments that were destined to lead to Russia's breakthrough in robotoid brain research began 32 years ago, in 1947. In that year a Hungarian-born physicist, Dr. Denis Gabor, conceived of a way to make three-dimensional photographs called holograms. It was a revolutionary scientific discovery, and it was destined to lead to the Nobel Prize for Dr. Gabor. He did not receive the prize until 24 years later, in 1971. By then holograms were a reality in numerous laboratories worldwide, and yet most members of the general public still had not heard of holography. And even today, more than three decades after Dr. Gabor's original discovery, holography is still unfamiliar to the public as a whole. In 1947, 
Dr. Gabor's theory pointed the way toward holography, but at that time holograms could not actually be made. What was needed in order to make them was something called monochromatic light, that is, light of just one wavelength. No one knew how to create that kind of light in 1947. But in 1960 the situation suddenly changed. That was the year the laser was invented. When lasers are discussed in public, attention is usually focused on just one of their amazing characteristics. That's the ability of a laser to produce a narrow, intense beam of light. The beam can travel great distances without spreading out and diffusing. Lasers pointed the way toward energy beam weapons, among other things, and as I revealed long ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, this is what secretly spawned America's crash program to get to the moon in 1961. But the reason laser beams behave the way they do is that the light they produce is monochromatic, so they are made to order for generating holograms. Like lasers, holography has led to developments that were totally unexpected, and one of these was the Russian breakthrough in biological computer brains some years ago. When you hear how they work, You'll understand why Robotoids act so much like the human beings they replace. I now continue with Topic No. 1. A hologram is a very unusual kind of photograph. To make one, the film is exposed using a laser and a set of mirrors and lenses, and to make the holograph image on the film visible later on, Laser light must again be used. When you look at a hologram, it is as if you were looking through a window at the real object. You can move back and forth, up and down, and see it from different angles in three-dimensional detail. By contrast, of course, a conventional photograph is flat and looks the same from all angles. Holograms are also different in another way. If you tear a normal photograph into several pieces, you ruin it. Each piece contains only a disconnected fraction of the total, but not so with a hologram. If you cut up a holographic film into several pieces, each piece still contains almost the entire image. There is some loss of detail, but basically it's all there. It's this fact that led years ago to the Russian breakthrough in biological computer brains for their robotoids. For quite some time scientists in the intelligence community worldwide studying the human brain have known one very important fact. That fact is that a portion of a human brain can be removed through accident or surgery, and yet the person still retains most of his original memory. So in this respect the memory in a human brain is like a hologram. Nowadays the relationship between holography and human memory is beginning to be understood in the West. For example, Dr. Carl Prebram, a neuropsychologist at Stanford University, wrote about it recently in the magazine Psychology Today. As he pointed out, the implications of holography are enormous, both for brain research and for computers. But this relationship was first recognized not in America, but in a research laboratory at Russia's Siberian Science City, Novosibirsk. The reason the Russians have scooped the West in many recent scientific discoveries is not that they are supermen while we are mental midgets. Instead it has to do with the way they organize their efforts in science and technology. This organization is totally different from that in the West and it's turning out to be far more efficient. For one thing, when it comes to research, communications in Russia are far superior to those in the West. There are more than 5,000 research centers and laboratories in Russia doing research and development of all kinds, and they are all linked together by vigorous communications not only within each scientific field but between different fields. There's also a fundamental difference in what is discussed in Russian technical literature as compared with the West. In the West a scientist usually publishes a technical paper only to report a success of some kind. If he carries out a research project that fails, 
he generally publishes nothing about it, but in Russia many failures and problems are discussed very openly in the technical literature. As a result, many areas of research meet a very different fate in Russia than in the West. Here in America an elaborate and expensive scientific project may come very close to success, but fall through because of a key missing ingredient. When that happens, very little is published about it, but in Russia the researchers describe their problems and failures, and among the thousands of other scientists nationwide, one might have the answer. So the Russian system, which is built around cooperation, often produces success, but the Western system, especially in America, is built around jealousy, and it often leads to failure. It's happened many times, my friends, and it happened several years ago in robotoid brain development. Last month I revealed that the Russians can manufacture organic robotoids which are almost exact carbon copies of real human beings. This is done by a process that simulates the genetic coding of the person to be copied. It sounds a little like cloning, but it's not. A clone of a human would itself be a human, but an organic robotoid is not human. It's an artificial life form, like an animal in some ways, but like a computerized machine in others. Every Russian robotoid has what is called a holographic brain. This brain duplicates essentially the entire memory of a person being copied. The key to doing this is a new technique called an ultrasonic cerebral hologram. Using high-frequency sound waves, which are inaudible, a complete three-dimensional picture is made of a person's brain. This is a painless, non-destructive process and under the proper conditions it can be done without the person even being aware of it. Last month I revealed that the Russians are using Nelson Rockefeller's hit list to weed out Bolsheviks here in America, and for roughly three years they have been preparing for this day. They have been secretly making cerebral holograms of the people on the list at every opportunity. This has been done to every person on Rockefeller's list who has visited Russia or Eastern Europe in the past three years. When an organic robotoid is made to simulate, for example, our late President Jimmy Carter, two major factors are involved. One is the genetic coding required to simulate Carter's appearance, voice, fingerprints, and so on. The other is a holographic image of Carter's brain. This image is a complete record of the neuron patterns which existed in Carter's brain at the moment the hologram was made. Therefore, it contains all of the memory and knowledge Carter had up to that moment. When a Carter robotoid is made, the biological computer in its head is caused to form according to the holographic record of Carter's brain. However, certain portions of the robotoid computer are caused to deviate from the holographic record. Uh, the end result is a biological computer which has to be programmed but which contains essentially all of Carter's memory, involuntary mannerisms, and the like. As a result, a Carter robotoid will automatically do certain kinds of things without the need for specific programming. For example, a Carter robotoid will seem to recognize old friends. That's because the computer memory of the robotoid reproduces Carter's memory of that friend. The holographic process puts it there automatically without the Russian programmers even having to know it's there. Organic robotoids are such amazing creatures that they are still a subject of questioning and debate. This is true even among the Russian scientists who made them a reality. For example, robotoids seem to have no true instinct for self-preservation. In this regard, they act like machines, simply doing as they are told to do. By contrast, both humans and animals generally have the instinct for self-preservation. Robotoids can be programmed for self-preservation, 
but they are equally willing, if willing is the word, to perform suicide missions. Exploratory one-way trips into space are only one example of this. If a space mission looks too dangerous to risk the life of an experienced cosmonaut, a Robotoid can now be used. The Robotoid copy of the cosmonaut is already trained the moment it's made thanks to its holographic memory. Organic Robotoids look and act so much like human beings that it's hard for us to get used to the idea that they are not human. But the Russians decided several months ago that the stakes are too high not to employ them, and so the silent Russian invasion of America by Robotoids is now well underway. Topic No. 2. The Russian strategy is to work from the top down in dismantling Bolshevik power here in the United States. In this respect they are doing the same thing in principle as they did in overthrowing Bolshevik power in Russia. Within Russia itself the overthrow process made use of human devils. These devils were Christians with a level of dedication that is almost unthinkable in the West. They underwent plastic surgery at the expense of a lifelong change in their appearance. They spent years in detailed study of the persons they were to replace, and then once they had replaced powerful people, they saw to it that other members of their Christian sect acquired positions of power. Over the years untold numbers of these Christian devils in powerful positions were eventually found out. When that happened they were purged by the Bolsheviks, but when they died they took with them the knowledge of the identities of other Christians whom they had placed in power, and so with every Christian they killed the Bolsheviks were gradually sealing their own fate. They never caught on to the master takeover plan of the native Russian Christians until it was too late. Today the Russians are putting that experience to use again in their robotoid strategy to take control of America. Bolshevik power is always centralized. So the Russians are starting with the head of the Bolshevik Serpent. From there they intend to work outward gradually to the many tentacles of Bolshevik power. As of now, the White House and Cabinet are under complete control by Russia. According to my latest intelligence report, only one member of the Carter Cabinet is still alive. All the rest including the ad hoc gang of four, have been replaced by Russian Robotoids. Likewise, the United States now has a Supreme Court made up of nine Russian Robotoids, and now Russia is focusing on the main members of the United States Senate who are opposing SALT II. When Carter Robotoid No. 3 was in Vienna earlier this month for the SALT II Summit, he acted like a puppy dog around Leonid Brezhnev No. 2, and Brezhnev II, the human double for the late real Brezhnev, likewise treated the alleged Carter like a puppy. Whenever he tired of talking or became hungry, Brezhnev II simply got up and walked off, and the grinning replica of the late Jimmy Carter would follow obediently at his heels. Finally on June 18, the Carter Robotoid set the world on its ear by kissing and hugging Brezhnev II after the SALT II signing ceremony. While the process of takeover is underway, the Russians will not render the Robotoids vulnerable to neutralization by the Bolsheviks. For that reason the Robotoids, which have already replaced certain Senators, are continuing to pretend that they oppose SALT II. To do otherwise would attract attention prematurely. But the really bitter opposition to SALT II is coming from people who don't know what is going on. My friends, the Russians are now speaking from strength. They are not bluffing. A few days ago on June 25, Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko went out of his way to demonstrate this fact. It is a very rare occurrence for Gromyko to give a news conference 
and even more rare for him to speak in English. But on the 25th he gave a two-hour news conference in Moscow, and to make sure he got his point across in no uncertain terms, he spoke in English. He declared that there must be no changes whatsoever in the SALT II Treaty, and he said, quote, I tell you frankly, it is impossible to resume negotiations. It would be the end of negotiations, the end, no matter what amendments would be made. Then after a moment's pause he added firmly, fantastic situation." Unquote. My friends, the ratification of SALT II could be the litmus test that will decide between peace and war for America and Russia. Twenty-one months ago on September 27, 1977, America lost the decisive battle of the Harvest Moon in space to Russia. That evening, as I reported that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, Gromyko delivered a SALT II ultimatum to the White House. Meanwhile, excited news reports said there had been a breakthrough in SALT II. That was a lie, as I told you at the time, and events since then have proven that it was a lie. Now Russia's ultimatum for SALT II is being repeated, and for the last time. When SALT II is ratified, secret provisions of the treaty will begin America's surrender by means of unilateral disarmament. The Russians are presently trying to achieve this ratification by replacing as few Senators as possible with robotoids. This approach is an act of mercy by the Kremlin which could now robotize the entire Senate if it wished and at will. This means there remains a slim chance that the Bolsheviks will somehow find a way to upset SALT II, but if they do, it will be, as Gromyko put it, the end. It will be the end of SALT II. It will also be the end of any remaining Russian restraint or mercy toward their Bolshevik enemies. And if the Russians should finally conclude that their plans for peace are hopeless, it will really be the end, because then they will do as Gromyko threatened at the White House 21 months ago. That is, they will give America the war which our former rulers tried so hard to bring about. My friends, the top priority of the new Christian rulers of Russia is to prevent NUCLEAR WAR ONE if possible. That's why the decision was made early this year, 1979, to deploy the Robotoids. If they had not done that, Saudi Arabia oil fields would have vanished in nuclear fireballs last month. The plan for an Israeli preemptive strike against Saudi Arabia, which I first made public late in 1975, would have been carried out. But as I reported last month, two top secret Middle East shuttles were carried out to stop the plan. One shuttle was in late April, the other during mid-May. The shuttles involved robotoid replacements for top American officials, and so far Saudi Arabia has been saved. If the Israeli strike against Saudi Arabia had been carried out, this would have provided the desired excuse for the contrived gasoline lines we are now seeing. For months they have been diverting petroleum products to other countries at a handsome profit instead of building up normal supplies here. By now they were expecting the Saudi Arabia strike to be an accomplished fact. Under those conditions we Americans would have simply accepted gasoline shortages, and the shortages would have been worsening fast on the way to a declaration of a national emergency. By the autumn of this year the Bolshevik plan for an American nuclear first strike against Russia would have been carried out, so the plan which I outlined in AUDIO LETTER No. 37 last August would now be in full swing. But by stopping the Saudi Arabia strike, at least for the time being, the Russians have so far kept the peace. Right now Israel is frustrated and is taking it out on southern Lebanon. Yesterday Israel violated her agreement with the United States and used F-15s to
to attack alleged Palestinian bases there, but the Russian robotoid replacement for Secretary of State Cyrus Vance ordered the State Department to issue an immediate and very stern written protest to Israel. The Russians have also put the big oil companies of the now headless Rockefeller cartel in a very embarrassing spot. Without a Saudi Arabia disaster to point to, they have no excuse to give for the gasoline shortages now taking place, but at the same time they cannot instantly increase supplies because they started turning down their own oil spigots months ago. So they have outsmarted themselves, my friends. Americans are growing more angry by the day because almost everyone can tell that it's all a big swindle. On all sides there is beginning to be a growing chorus of nationalize the oil companies. The Russians are using their robotoids in an attempt to stop the Bolshevik war schemes, and they are doing so even though they know there is a risk to themselves in what they are doing. Bolsheviks have infiltrated into positions of power throughout American society, so rooting them out is a gigantic challenge. This is especially true in the military. A quarter century ago the late Senator Joseph McCarthy made a genuine and brave attempt to stop this infiltration, but America's Bolsheviks succeeded in cutting him down using tactics far worse than those of which he was accused. So today there are Bolsheviks at every level and in every branch of the United States military. Using their robotoids, the Russians may be able to ferret them out within 18 months to two years, but during that time Bolshevism will remain a very dangerous force here in America. The Bolsheviks may well keep on trying to find a way to surprise and destroy Russia. So if Russia's rulers of today shared the Bolsheviks' fascination with war, they would not bother to use the robotoys. Instead they would just stir up a confrontation between Russia and America and then unleash their space triad. Since late 1977, as I've reported in my tapes, there have been seven Russian Particle Beam weapons bases on the near side of the moon. These could start pounding American strategic targets worldwide into dust without producing radioactive fallout. If the United States attempted to counterattack with ICBMs, they would be blasted during launch by the Cosmospheres now floating overhead. Under 37 Russian Cosmos interceptors now in orbit would continue to deny America a military toehold in space. These satellites are manned and armed with charged Particle Beam weapons. They finished destroying America's spy satellites over a year ago, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 33. But at the very least, such a war would kill tens of millions of people, mostly in the United States, and if things got out of hand, a full-fledged thermonuclear war could kill hundreds of millions. My friends, the rulers of Russia today are Christians, and to them nuclear war is insanity if it can be avoided, and so they are using their robotoids. Earlier this month on June 16, Leonid Brezhnev No. 2 summed up Russia's attitude at the SALT II summit in Vienna. He said, quote, God will not forgive us if we fail. Unquote. Many people were shocked to hear those words, but I reported the explanation long ago in my AUDIO LETTERS such as No. 38. Russia's leaders are out to save their own souls. Topic No. 3 My friends, we are now living through a critical and confusing period. Most of our neighbors are asleep, unaware that their destinies are hanging in the balance, and for those of us who are awake it is a difficult and lonely time. I don't think anyone could express it any better than Dr. Harry Schultz. 
In the late June 1979 issue of his famous International Investment Advisory letter, he mentions that his readers often cannot understand or believe his investment advice because he has always been ahead of his time, and here's how he expresses it, quote, To gain universal appeal you must be too late, not too early. To be popular you must predict and write what even the general public have already perceived to be happening." Unquote. And how true! More and more the events we see will be reflecting Russia's gradual takeover of the United States, but at the same time things which were put into the pipeline by the four Rockefeller brothers before they died will be gradually winding down. Our present manipulated gasoline shortages are a good example. These are things which were set in motion long ago, and they have too much momentum to come to a halt overnight. The same is true of Bolshevik schemes which have been gathering steam in the United States now for nearly two years. As I've explained in the past, the Bolshevik mentality is one in which human life is only a tool of power. Last November 1978 the Guyana tragedy took place, a military operation in which hundreds of civilian lives were sacrificed as a ploy. In AUDIO LETTER No. 40 I described what took place there in detail. Then in March there was the Bolshevik sabotage of the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant. In AUDIO LETTER No. 45 I reported what had been done. Its purpose was to help in the Bolshevik shutdown of America, using human lives as a tool of revolution, and only late last month it happened again when an American Airlines DC-10 was sabotaged by explosive by remote control. The result was the tragic, senseless, inhuman inferno of American Airlines Flight 191 in Chicago. But the Chicago DC-10 crash was for nothing because the Russians, using their robotoids, are undoing the Rothschild Bolshevik shutdown plans for America. This is just one example of the cross currents now going on behind the scenes. My friends, the United States is now being transformed into a satellite state of the Soviet Union. So the schemes which were set in motion, first by the Rockefellers and then by the Bolsheviks, will gradually fade away. Already robotoid replacements for top American officials are beginning to subtly speak the Russian line on major issues. And when it comes to SALT II, the Carter robotoids are not even being subtle about it. Every few days Moscow repeats, quote, we will accept no amendments, unquote. and each time an echo comes forth from a Carter robotoid, quote, we will accept no amendments, unquote. My friends, in AUDIO LETTERS No. 44 and 45 I propose that the Christ Ones of America go on a pilgrimage for peace to meet with Russia's leaders. The response to my proposal from American Christians has been overwhelming. Only a handful of ministers and church officials have responded. Instead, it has been primarily the Christians in all other walks of life. Already enough people have expressed interest to fill up not just one, but several Aerofloat jet transports. Up to now, my friends, I have had no official reply from the Russian Government about my proposal. So far they have not turned us down, but a pilgrimage like this would be a very serious matter. Whatever they decide, we cannot go back to business as usual because, my friends, nothing will ever be the same again. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.